episode of I'm in a Car in the Works, and I have the honor of having Carol Lehman, who's on a fun. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So, um, we really don't know each other. No. And I, I just happened to meet you at the, whatever, the Profit 500. Yeah. Uh, you did a little thing on stage, and I came up and I said, hey, you're in Waterloo. You want to do an I'm in a Car with me? And uh, Carol was like, sure. I had no idea what it is I was asking about. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, we, you guys said congratulations. You won the award for it was business of the year over fifty. Is that right? Uh, it was business at the profit five hundred. No, no, or, at the greater Kelowna oh, Chamber. Oh, um, the greater. Yeah, it was just business of the year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, over fifty people. Yeah, that's I right. think that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, now we're now we're in a car taking a ride. We're in a car. So in uh, in true kind of uh, I'm in a car fashion, can you give the audience a little rundown of where you've been and what you're up to these days? Yeah, uh, so this is uh, my fourth tech company, um, all in Waterloo region over the last 20 years. And uh, it's just been, you know, one great opportunity after another. Um, and I've sold the previous three companies and started this thing with a business partner six years ago and here we are today 150 people and having a blast cool so what was the first one first one was a company called fake space which was a very high-end virtual reality company um, high fidelity immersive virtual reality solutions way back in the day when nobody had a consumer facing solution cool um, so yeah it was a really cool company and then you sold that. And sold then that. Started up another one. That's right. Because it wasn't enough torture going through the first one. Yeah. Round. So why not do another one? Yeah, and in fact, I didn't start the second one. I uh, was hired to do a turnaround of a company that was struggling, and in fact, was almost dead. It was out of cash, and I was hired in by the investors to do a turnaround and see what needed to really happen with the product and the company. Yeah, okay. And so I um, essentially rebuilt it um, with the help of many people, um, rebuilt the product and uh, looked at all the go-to-market and ultimately ended up selling it two years later to another company, software company, that had a need for that particular thing in their suite of products. So so that was good. Got yeah. that done that was heavy lifting was for two yeah years. there's a lot I mean, you can have a whole conversation around that yeah that was a uh, two years of really heavy lifting to get that thing fixed and in a position where it could be sold at all right so um, you know learned a lot through that process and then went to Communitech actually to I was intending to take a year off and just um have fun and help some friends of mine who yeah. had portfolio companies that needed a bit of help. And Ian Klugman invited me to start their EIR program. So uh, I did that for about 10 months and ended up meeting a couple of entrepreneurs that were looking for seed investment, invested in that company, and then ended up going to run it. Uh, three months later. <laughs> I didn't take long. Yeah, so I did that for three and a half years right. and sold that in 2011 and had been helping the original founders of Exonify with this company. Uh, it was in its infancy. They had one customer, some really sketchy source code. Yeah. And, <laughs> but I saw what I could do with it. Yeah. And so um, I ended up with a business partner buying essentially the company, the one customer, and uh, took two of the original employees and started over from scratch. And that was six years ago. Amazing. Yeah. And so what's Exonify all about and what, is, what are you up to right now? So Exonify is a company that delivers a really fast, fun, personalized, daily learning experience. It takes three to five minutes a day and what it does at the core is change human behavior to get the employee to do things the employer needs them to do right. to achieve a business outcome. 
And so we use um, a really unique combination of cognitive science, some principles of brain science yeah. that create memory and retention in the brain really, really fast. Cool. And those are the things that change behavior. And so we can get employees to sell more. We can get employees to stop having accidents if it's a safety application. Um, whatever you need them to do, we can make them change that behavior pretty quickly and then tie it to the business. So without going into too much depth, how the heck do you do that? Because that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's um, so it turns out that we sort of accidentally discovered that people do what they know. So if it's in their brain and easily accessible when they encounter a situation where they need to do something, right. they will do the right thing. If they don't know, they'll start to guess. And people guess at work a lot, as it right. turns out. Okay. And when they guess, a lot of times they do things incorrectly. That costs money. So if it's a safety application and they uh, need to climb a ladder and they're not quite sure the five things they need to do to secure the ladder, then they just might do three of them and climb the ladder and fall off. And it turns out most people don't realize ladder uh, accidents are incredibly prevalent in the workplace. Yeah, and cause massive injury. My father-in-law is in pelvis. Really? In December. No way. Falling off a ladder. Yep. And he's been in construction his whole life. There you go. Yeah. And so that is one of Sorry, hundreds. Paul, if you watch this, I didn't mean to throw you <laughs> under the ladder. <laughs> but, you need Exonify. Yeah. <laughs> I can a, hook there, you up. Is there a ladder safety module? <laughs> there is. <laughs> yeah, that's ladder safety, forklift safety, yeah. you, any safety, we can help. That's cool. <laughs> and so then there's just the, this principle, which is, I mean, really profoundly simple. That if so, and, and what I love about that idea is that there's no when a when a the assumption that you kind of implied was that employees and workers aren't doing things wrongly because they are being malicious right. or ignorant. Oh, exactly. They're doing it because they're guessing they just and they don't, don't know. have the clarity. Totally. They just don't know. And it, honestly, it's not their fault that they don't know. Their companies don't train them right. properly. And so the, the whole crux of Exonify is really founded on the, the reality, and it's still true today, 35% of workers in North America literally get zero training when they go on the job. Zero. <laughs> zero. Zero. All right, you're hired. Good. Go, go get them. <laughs> yeah. One in three people gets nothing. Crazy. And then of the people that get trained, half of those say, if you, if you ask them, it's completely ineffective. Right. So a very small percentage of people at work in North America genuinely know what they're doing. <laughs> that would explain a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, what a wonderful hello. company and opportunity to be a part of to like help change that. Yeah, it's That's awesome. Neat. It's oh. awesome. We, yeah. So we get just an incredible. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the vast majority of people actually have no idea what they're no doing. No idea. <laughs> Zero. I swear to God, you are just blowing me away. I'm, I'm like, oh man, this makes so much sense. Now yeah. I understand why yeah. I'm experiencing the world the way I am. Yeah, exactly. It, it, you know, I could give you so many examples. And I'm sure you've experienced them in your life where, you know, like, let's just take a quick one. In retail, this actually happened to me where you go, I had coupons, I go up to the associate in the store and I say, can I use these coupons on top of the 30% discount on the coffee maker? And she's like, no, you can only take the discount on the rack. Okay, fine. And so I grab the coffee maker and I take it to another clerk and I say, can I use my coupon on top of the 30%? And she's like, oh yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> I got an extra 30% off yeah. instead. So I have no idea who was right. All I know is I saved a lot of money yeah. and that retailer 
probably lost a bunch of money. Yeah. And if you extrapolate that one little piece of knowledge about how to properly apply a coupon in a retail setting, and you're talking about a billion dollar retailer, you are talking about billions of dollars of sales lost yeah. every year. And that's just one little tiny example of people guessing because they don't know. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that second gal didn't want to disappoint a customer. I sure. don't know. But either way, you don't know. They don't know. Right. There's guessing happening. Totally. And so eliminate that and you start creating a lot more execution and performance exactly. inside the company. That's cool. Exactly. So then going back to this, uh, you know, technology startup kind of, you know, there's a lot of buzz. There's a lot of uh, excitement and energy around that kind of environment. Um, you know, one of the things I've, I've had happen, so running Intrigue Media, a marketing company, uh, ever so ever so often we have startup companies knock on our door and say, hey, can you help us, you know, help market our company? And, and I'll ask the question like, okay, well, how many customers do you have now? And what's, what's your, you know, monthly revenue look like? And, and more often than not, it's zero. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of of the mind that, well, why don't you go talk to some customers and get them to give you some money? And then once that's happening, we'll be able to figure out what marketing can support mm -hmm. the behavior to get more of that happening. Mm -hmm. But I can't just generate dollars for you. So then we end up not working together, that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. what, I, what I've experienced is that people are kind of holding off on this go to market with revenue. So can you just speak to that and when people should look at it? Maybe yeah, for sure. You know, I, I have to say I'm still really surprised at how some entrepreneurs think they just need to perfect this thing and take two years to perfect it before they start testing it with customers and in market. Bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, is you need to go find a customer as fast as humanly possible, even if they're not the first few, the first handful aren't paying you oodles of dollars for what you've got. You need somebody using what you're building to prove the value. And then you've got proof points to then be able to sell it to the next batch. Sure. And until you do that and you've got a customer actively using what you're building and selling, do not expect the situation that if you build it, they will come because more often than not, you're not building the right thing. Fill the dreams, just messed everybody up. Totally. Kevin totally. Costner, what were you thinking? Exactly. Exactly. So then when, when is it the time? Like, you know, because conceptually I understand what you said, but like, how does somebody get out of their own way to say, okay, F it. Mm -hmm. Let's go get some customers. Mm -hmm. Even if they're free, we need users or something. Or yeah. you know, pay us a dollar or something. As soon as you have something functional, even if it is the most basic thing, as soon as you have something functional, find somebody to use it in a real life setting. And then start to iterate from there. So, you know, it has to work. Yeah. So you do have to interview customers or prospective customers, design the thing in a way that you believe is going to add value based on what they've told you. Right. But as soon as you get that first kind of set of features, de minimis features that you think is going to add value, go find that customer to test it for you. And um, don't think, you know, you need to spend a year building all kinds of stuff and then go find the customer. It really is a constant iterative process and you need to start down that path as soon. In fact, even before you have something. There it is. Before you have something. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So then, um, just to go how for a second, and, and I know this question to me is kind of uh, weird, but if, if you could just tell a bunch of people that are you know in startup mode, thinking about starting up, whatever, how do you reach out to customers? Uh, well, um, you just pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said just because if you minimize that, just can, yeah. you, can you repeat that for a second? You, yeah, you, you pick. pick up the phone. <laughs> it is again, you know, people forget we're all just people. Yeah. And if I need something, I just pick up the phone and you are going to get rejection 100%. And lots of it. And lots of it. And you just, if you're a true entrepreneur, you will have the intestinal fortitude to keep going. And eventually you will find somebody. Now, start with the friendlies, you know, 
start with people you know who have connections to other people and where you can you know offer to just find a test environment for free yeah you know you're not coming out of the gate going well I need 25k from you to build this little thing and embed it in your company you gotta you gotta just work with people and if what you're building is valuable to the market that you're going after you will find somebody right. who's willing to jump on board and and help you develop test you know from the point of view of being a, a live use case you, but you, you have to I mean customers don't just fall out of the trees <laughs> and go hey yeah, we used to, when we started we were cold calling like crazy and we used to say to people when they joined the company we're in the rock turning business and we would paint this picture that hey we're on a beach a rocky beach yeah and our job is to just go turn over rocks and every totally. once in a while you're going to find a crab who's just mean but they're rare. Yeah. Most of the time you're going to find nothing. Yeah. And then every once in a while you're going to find somebody who's been like, help me, help me. You're just waiting for you to turn exactly. over that rock to help them out. Exactly. And, and all the worked. way along, <laughs> it helps you perfect your pitch and your approach and your messaging and stuff too. Because if you keep saying the same thing and it's not resonating, you need to adjust it. So, but if you keep going, you, if you have something of value, you will find customers or yeah. prospects and pick up the phone yeah <laughs> it's so true and I and I find uh, you know with email and social uh, a lot of people kind of and I I've, I've, I've heard this a lot oh I sent two emails and nobody emailed me back yeah and there's like this kind of surprise in the tone shocker <laughs> two emails wow <laughs> wow that's fortitude <laughs> Uh, anyway, okay, cool. So, um, what is it about this environment that gets you just drawn in? Like, why are you doing it again and again and again? It's not easy work. It's not easy work. But, you know, I clearly have a need to... Um, Be abused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just joking. No, what is that? I didn't mean to interrupt. It's more Sorry. like self-flagellation. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I love the whole I love the difficulty of it actually I love the figuring it out and and I think it's because fundamentally I believe I can that may be stupid but I believe <laughs> that I can well you've got a track record now that would agree with you right so so now that I've done it a few times I kind of have this perspective of it's fun I get to learn tons of new stuff meet lots of new people um, and help lots of other people be successful. And I love that. I absolutely, it's like an adrenaline rush, really. That's cool. It totally is. And, you know, you have your days that are up, down, sideways. I, that's just the way it is. Um, but I just love it. I absolutely love it. I am in my sweet spot. That's cool. And there's, few people are, right? Mm -hmm. So ride the wave, I guess, when you get yeah, that chance. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, Going back to that second business where out of cash, dead, sketchy source code, like what kind of things did you see and then be do to mm -hmm. turn something like that around? Like when I hear the idea of no cash, I, my heart stops. I'm just like, <laughs> you have no cash. It's, you're done. Like that's it. It's over. Yeah, exactly. So what, how do you turn that away? What'd you do? Well, I wrote a $70,000 check the first week to make payroll. Yeah, that'll, that'll help. Off my line of credit <laughs> that yeah that that helped yeah that's cash yes <laughs> um that was a case of you know every single thing going on in that organization was broken to some degree so the product didn't work the market they were going after didn't really exist to be honest so they were building something for a market that was tiny and going away um, yeah, that's not a good recipe. Right. They had no kind of strategic direction. They had some good people, but they had some kind of not so good people on board. Um, nobody was really minding the farm and trying to think about how do we build this business because clearly what we're doing doesn't work. So it was just they kept going and going and going and spending money hand over fist to get nowhere. Right. And so it was a matter of fixing the product, 
hiring really good, competent people, looking at the market and what the market was willing to actually buy and get it to a place where the software and the customer base would be attractive to an acquirer. So I knew pretty quickly that it was a case of this is not going to be a great big billion dollar company. Sure. This is going to be a, an acquisition and we just need to build it to a place where uh, yeah, somebody wants to buy it. So there was a lot though and you just said as, as much as you did say it quickly, um, but you're like, we just got to fix the product, hire some great talent, you know, refocus the target audience and ensure we're building something of value that people want to buy. Mm -hmm. Like that was like a one, two, three step process, but I mean like that. Yeah, it took uh, two years. <laughs> yeah, and, and so then, you know, you write a $70,000 check out of the gate and then when you, so here's a question then, hiring great talent, what, how do you go about doing that without having to break a bank account? Because right now I know that there's a common perception, mm -hmm. right or wrong, mm -hmm. that great talent's really expensive and it's tough to do. So like, how do you how do you do that? How do you just go out and make that happen? Yeah, well, it is a process and it isn't easy. And you know, so the seventy thousand was me saving payroll that first week I was on the job because they had no money, and then I raised capital. Okay. So. Um, that bought us time to retool on every front and and it did take time there uh it isn't easy to hire super awesome people like instantly um you know you do have to kind of do it as quickly as you can um so we did and uh got an amazing vp of software development um uh, VP marketing, a variety of people that could really increase the level of bench strength that we needed to be able to take it forward. Um, so yeah, it wasn't easy. It, it was, uh, even though we knew th what the answers were, we had to do this, 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 and this, getting it done took a huge amount of effort and two years. And Eventually, it was successful, but uh, it wasn't just snap your fingers and get it done. It no. was it was a process. Yeah, that's cool. So, as a leader in four companies, um, purpose, vision, mission, values, all that stuff. What's your take on all that? Company has to have purpose. Uh, it does need to understand what are you trying to build for who and why does it matter. The, you know, ultimately that and then how do you do it with the right kind of culture is my summary of all of that mission vision values um it, you know you just uh to me you need to be um focused on doing the right things with the right people and creating an environment where you're just having fun and and wanting to be the best that you can possibly be and that's uh, dependent on so many factors, but, sure. um, you know, I think that if everybody feels like they're doing something important, pulling on the rope in the same direction and they get to have fun and learn and feel empowered and valuable inside the company, you can do anything, anything. So what are some of the things that you do to start to make that a reality? Like if you go into an organization and it seems like, you know, Exonify, there was a, there was a team before you got involved. Mm -hmm. um, the s second business that you were in fully was happening, just not well. Mm -hmm. The third one wasn't a startup. It was, it was brand, startup, new, brand new, brand, brand new. new. So that's yeah. a bit of a different one. Yeah. So then what do you do when you go into an organization and you see things are maybe not, not everybody's pulling the rope the same way. Mm -hmm. What kind of, what kind of tactics or mechanics that you use to try to get that happen? Um, you know, to me, it starts with, A, you got to model the right behavior, say the right things. People need to see the tone has changed. And, um, you know, so I always try to model the behavior and the attitude that I want everybody else to exhibit. And that goes a huge way towards changing culture, um, where you find people don't get on board with that, you know, as I've gone into existing organizations, there's, you know, 
the odd person who just is stuck in their own way of thinking and you know it's about them it's not about the greater good or the people they work with um you know ultimately sometimes you got to make a change with that because you know there's only so much time you can try to encourage people to think the right way um and you know that's the whole thing start doing the right things at the end I'm a firm believer that people want to come to work every day and be great performers, get recognized for it, um, do the right things, feel valued, see what they're doing matters and that they're accomplishing something and, and adding value. People want that generally. And so if they feel safe that they can do that and make mistakes and not get, you know, embarrassed and yeah, yeah, you can get people to behave the right way pretty quickly. And so really it starts with, um, me and how I am and then making sure the leadership team thinks and behaves the same way. And then that just sort of naturally filters down and you can create what I've, you know, talked about at Exonify many times, almost like, um, an immune system where you are this really strong immune system as a company and culture and if the odd person you hire or that exists is like a virus trying to penetrate the immune system and they don't fit, if the immune system is strong, the virus can't get in. Yeah, that's cool. And those that are in there kind of end up self-selecting out in a lot of ways. So um, that really is the goal and just to create that strong, safe, positive environment where everybody feels like they're adding value every day. That's awesome. And probably a lot more profound than people might think. I'm going to watch that one again myself because that was really well said. And that idea of the immune system and the self-selection, I mean, it's a big assumption that the immune system is highly functional yes, and cohesive. But yeah. um, still, I think that is a really cool description of how that all works. So um, when it comes to people feeling accomplished, mm -hmm and feeling like they're contributing and what they're doing matters. Is accountability part of that? Is, is like, mm -hmm. uh, we're, right now we're, we're whatever, 30 staff, and we went from a company of two, mm -hmm. and we've always had this kind of like, everybody in it together, we're all pitching in, yeah. and so no one really has any like defined, I am fully responsible for this right now. Mm -hmm. And we're a little bit hesitant, scared to initiate that type of accountability but still having this thought that well if somebody knows what they're responsible for they can come in and rock it mm -hmm. but is are they too are they connected um they are at the end when you're small um people know what everybody else is doing and like it's very visible and so people do tend to be a little more accountable without using those words only because it's visible to everybody else what they're doing or not doing and the impact that they're having um, is easier to see as you grow you do need to kind of instill a bit more structure around the goals and objectives of the individual and the team that they're working on as they roll up to the whole and then and you need to do that because it, it, there's so many people, it's not obvious what everybody else is doing, working on, um, you know, contributing, getting done. And there are so many dependencies that exist based on what people are doing that you do need to define it a little more clearly and set specific goals and objectives with timelines attached that people feel accountable to because you know, we have, for example, um, a whole series of meetings where we just connect on where certain things are at, certain initiatives. And, you know, people know if they're supposed to have done something and they didn't get it done, there are four other people waiting on them yeah. to get that done. So it's a natural evolution with time and growth. And you kind of need to be thinking about that. Now, 30 people to 50 people is a, yeah. 
no it's going to ring twice. <laughs> and then we should be good. That's Fred calling. Hi, Fred. Mr. Hi, Fred. <laughs> um, as you get bigger. Yeah, as you get bigger, you, you, you should be thinking about those things. And, and now 30 to 50 is about the time where you should start to be thinking about formalizing a little bit of that. We're yeah. Feeling. Yeah, and and then so then that's the the scary thing, and I mean I'm this is a video that all the team's gonna watch, right? So it's kind of weird to put this out there like this, but you know we have this fun culture, uh, flat fun learning leadership action team and trust. Oh, nice. And and can, accountability isn't in that. Uh, I mean, it's part of leadership. Do what you say you're gonna do when you say you're gonna do it. That's the explanation of leadership inside the culture we have. Mm-hmm. Um, so just you know, there's this there's this hesitance, this tentativeness that is around, are we messing with something that was been so great for so long? And, and on the flip side, we, maybe we need to do this just to make it so that everybody's clear so that we can have a culture where people feel like they're accomplished. Yep. They're contributing. They're yep. doing something that matters. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just, you know, you can't, you can't grow and not have some structure in place. And I mean, you know, all the words you just said to kind of describe your values and, you know, all of that and the way that you work together is awesome. Um, and there is a natural accountability that comes out of, out of a lot of that. But again, as you grow, things start to get a little fragmented. And I mean, we've gone through 50, getting to 100. Now we're 150. There are points where I've heard people say, you know, it's not the way it used to be. It's not the same as it used to be. And, and that's just a natural feeling that people have because they're less in touch with everything that's going on. And so you do need structure to make sure that the overarching goals and objectives all have sub objectives that people are working on and being held accountable to. Otherwise, the whole engine won't work. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's simple. So really, I'm just uh, trying to frame the question as much as possible so you can say, yeah, 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 go, go do that. So, <laughs> no, yeah, I'm done, I'm done. Um, so if you could go back when you started this whole thing with your first business and tell yourself something that you know now that you wish you know then, what would it be? Um, gosh, I've learned so many lessons over the years. Um, I would say probably the first big lesson that I, I learned that I wish I'd known at the time was pay more attention to market size. Um, we had a company that, so this was the very first company fake space. Um, we had a company that had a very small global market for this high fidelity virtual reality stuff. And I didn't appreciate how small that was and what that meant for the growth of the company. Um, I wish I had known that earlier on because I would have done some strategic things differently. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, I mean, like I say, I've learned a million yeah. lessons over 20 years <laughs> and I'm sure. still learning lessons. <laughs> yeah. It never stops. Um, I just think naturally you, with experience of doing things, um, there's always things you, you wish you'd known. Um, but I would say for the most part, the things I wish I'd known were more business oriented. You know, think about this. Um, do this quickly, right. that sort of thing, and um, yeah. Cool. So you're pretty happy with the way that. Well, and what were you doing right before you got into? I'm a chartered accountant. Of course. Yeah. I would have guessed that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I I did my CA, which is now CPA, public accounting, and was hired by a, a client, Electra Home and did corporate finance for them for five or six years, buying and selling companies, raising capital. And uh, that's how I got into fake space. We bought it and I became the CEO of that, that uh, company that we bought. And that kind of got me on the whole running tech company thing. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for doing the show. Thanks for having yeah, me. That was awesome. Cheers.